Now, we've been talking about how Texas is developing into the 20th century, but we forgot our old friend, our old friend Mexico. What's been going on in Mexico since we parted company at the end of the U.S.-Mexican War? Uh, we talked a little bit about kind of some of the stuff that was going on, but let me bring you up to speed. Um, Santa Ana, the great boogeyman of the Texas uh, Revolution days, uh, actually makes a comeback even after all those events and is finally at the top of his game yet again in the early 1850s before finally tripping himself up and um, losing power and being exiled completely out of Mexico. So his career is pretty much done. Surprisingly though, just so you can kind of have closure with Santa Ana, he dies of natural causes in bed back in Mexico City. Interesting career, but that's for another time. What happened after the age of Santa Ana? Well, there's a uh, an idea that the age of Caudillos was bad for the country, and so you have this movement towards La Reforma, or the reform, and the great hero of that is Benito Juarez. And Benito Juarez fights a civil war in Mexico in the 1850s known as the War of the Reform. Essentially, it replaces the old liberal or federalist construct and conservative or centralist construct with the reformers and the old guard. The old guard loses. They don't like the outcome. They begin looking for a champion. And this time they go to Europe, find a champion in the form of Napoleon III, who puts a puppet ruler on the throne of Mexico in the 1860s. Uh, this is known as the French Intervention and the emperor's name is Maximilian I of the Mexican Empire. All that falls to smithereens by 1867, and uh, then Juarez takes over as president of Mexico and is reelected again in 1871. So it looks as though there's going to be some stability. However, as with many Mexican uh, elections, the election of 1871 is contested primarily because Juarez says that he would not seek an additional term, but he sought it anyway. He is opposed by a guy named Porfirio Diaz. Porfirio Diaz is mad that uh, he has been essentially denied access to the presidency, and so he throws a rebellion. Juarez dies of natural causes. He's replaced by another guy by the name of Lerdo. Uh, Lerdo says, look, if you'll just quit throwing your revolution, Diaz, we'll give you some amnesty. Diaz is given amnesty, but even so, he uh, spends his time in exile first in Brownsville and then in New Orleans. Um, when Lerdo looks like he's going to try to stay in uh, office as well, uh, Diaz comes back and says, you know what? There should be no re-election for Mexican presidents and they should serve a term and then get out of the way. So he throws a rebellion in 1876-1877 and wins. Lerdo leaves the country. Now Diaz is declared president in 1876. Porfirio Diaz then will lend his name to a 35-year period of Mexican history known as the Porfiriato. So, while Texas is going through its late 19th century gyrations, Mexico is now in the hands of what could best be described as a military strongman. Uh, some would refer to him as an outright dictator. But whatever the case, he puts lead on Mexico and keeps a pretty tight rein on things. Uh, in fact, what he does is he creates a political system in Mexico that allows the ruling party to be perpetuated in power. Nice. Uh, the way that this is done is through judicious political assassinations and other intrigues, uh, many of which might be considered brutal. Whatever the case, Diaz perpetuates himself in power all the way into the 20th century. Interestingly, he keeps running on the platform of no re-election, but he ends up always getting re-elected. <laughs> so, uh, in 1884... He just throws off any pretense of not standing for re-election and says, you know what, I'm going to change the Constitution so that I can always get re-elected and then I'll put some order in this otherwise messed up country. And he does. Uh, 
some of the things that he does is he tackles the uh, overwhelming Mexican foreign debt uh, that keeps uh, Mexico in good graces with their European creditors. Um, he pays government workers a living wage and gets some talent into the government, improves Mexico's international credit. Uh, he addresses some of the infrastructure issues in Mexico like uh, railroads, brings in American railroad engineers to lay tracks across the nation of Mexico, stretches telegraph lines around the country, uh, improves the ports, dredges out the harbors, uh, improves the mines, pumps out the water, gets mines back up and running, again using a lot of European and American mining engineers to get that done, and builds roads. So he is really turning Mexico into a modern country. Uh, he suppresses smuggling, uh, smuggling across the U.S. border in particular, and actually creates a Mexican border patrol that keeps Americans from coming into Mexico illegally. His uh, biggest idea, or the biggest slogan that he works under, is the idea of order and progress. He is a progressive, a Mexican progressive. And as a result, he surrounds himself with learned men, los científicos, that will essentially figure out how to bring order and efficiency to Mexico. As a result, Porfirio Diaz is internationally adored. Uh, Leo Tolstoy refers to Diaz as a prodigy of nature. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany gives Diaz the nation's highest honor uh, that's ever bestowed to a foreigner. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, American industrialist, says that Porfirio Diaz is a man of wisdom and courage. Even Theodore Roosevelt declares that Diaz is perhaps the greatest statesman now living. He's got a big fan club. Well, what was his secret for success? There's a couple of phrases he used that I think are instructive. One is, a dog with a bone in its mouth neither barks nor bites. So if you can throw the people a bone, they'll gnaw on that bone instead of biting it to government. Hey, okay, that makes sense. Another phrase, love isn't everything in life. So sometimes you'd rather be feared than loved, and that's kind of Porfirio Diaz. Uh, but in 1908, he makes an interesting utterance. He says, I have no desire to continue in the presidency. This nation is ready for her ultimate life of freedom. 